Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Dan Klein, President and CEO of the Patient Access Network, or PAN Foundation, in Washington, D.C., which helps uninsured people with life-threatening chronic and rare diseases. Stephen Ramirez, President and CEO of the California Health Collaborative in Fresno, California, which provides a variety of health programs and services. And Dr. John Rodas, president of the St. Francis Hospital and Medical Center in Hartford, Connecticut, a major teaching hospital and the largest Catholic hospital in New England. Thank you for joining us panel. And a reminder to all those attending the webinar that you can ask questions in the Q&A and chat functions. And we'll try to get to those during this discussion and, and afterwards. So thank you all for, for coming. Um, let's talk about this situation that we're all facing first, this intersection of the normal operations that you are constantly providing, the, the services that you're constantly providing, and then now on top of that, this once in a millennia pandemic that, that really has uh, totally affected the entire world and in the United States has led to over 60,000 deaths uh, a million uh, infections, and that's going to continue for quite some time. Dan, why don't you talk uh, initially about how you've confronted this situation in your area at PAN? Sure, thank you, Mark. At the PAN Foundation, our, our mission is to help people get access to their critical treatments um, by helping pay for out-of-pocket costs. So we are already operating sort of in the uh, fault line, if you will, of the healthcare system, or one of the fault lines. And the uh, uh, COVID pandemic has really exposed all of the fault lines, all of the challenges, particularly in our case, we're concerned about how it's amplifying the need for um, help uh, with paying for healthcare. And you know, we're serving um, hundreds of thousands of patients each year. We provide um, $400 million in grants to help people on Medicare primarily pay for their deductibles, their co-pays. And these are all seriously ill patients, people with cancer, chronic illnesses, rare diseases. And they are being disproportionately affected, as you can imagine, uh, by the COVID pandemic. They're elderly, um, they are already on limited incomes, and this is just uh, made all the much harder. So what we've done is launch a new fund for COVID assistance. And uh, just in the past few weeks, we've given out 1,500 grants uh, for people to use in whatever that way they need. So to help pay for food or transportation, really anything uh, that would be helpful to them. So far, we've seen three quarters of the money in those grants is being used for food, which is uh, uh, really revealing. The uh, seniors who are getting grants from us uh, are uh, using it to help uh, uh, with meals. So it's that, that connection between income and health is, is, is so stark. Stephen, talk a little bit about how you're confronting that same issue where, uh, of course, you must provide health care, but you also need to cover the costs so that you can keep operating and keep providing uh, health services. Yes, Mark, it's a great question. So um, I think what we did early on, um, we had planned a month before we were closed down in the state of California. Um, to make a, a transition in our operations from, from the office to home. As you know, the California Health Collaborative um, is a statewide organization. We focus on underserved populations, particularly rural communities. Rural communities um, have two, I think, really two issues. One is access to health care. I mean, there's limited access sometimes because of distances to health care. And secondly, as you mentioned, the, uh, the un underinsured and uninsured. What we've done as an organization is really transition to really multiple platforms of service, everything from telemedicine to using Zoom uh, to partnering with other agencies to be able to reach our most vulnerable populations. And we serve everybody from prenatal to seniors. So it has been quite challenging, but there's no question that we've had to partner with many other nonprofits to serve those populations. And uh, in a different way, obviously, not that we can see them in person now because of the pandemic, but through other means, technology and otherwise. But we've been successful in doing that. I'm proud of my staff. They've done a wonderful job um, being able to um, be resourceful in this time when uh, we've been challenged with not being able to see patients face to face. So we're fortunate that um, we work closely with hospitals and healthcare facilities and other nonprofits 
to meet the needs of underserved populations throughout California. So that's what we've been doing pretty much, Mark, the last uh, almost two months, basically. And, and you're forging connections with people f uh, remotely because the physical presence is no longer as possible. But John, when you're, when you're serving your patients, you're serving them within a hospital setting. You're providing acute medical care um, for patients in a lot of distress. You're trying to keep your own staff safe while doing so. Talk about your experience through this amazing change where it's in the last three months, it must be like night and day where you are. Yeah, it's an incredible challenge. Uh, first, thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, we, this all started only about 100 days ago when you think about it. And uh, when it started here in Connecticut, for first of all, I'm at St. Francis Hospital, which is a 600 bed level one trauma hospital in Hartford. We're part of Trinity Health, which has more than 90 hospitals uh, in 22 states. So we've kind of got a national perspective on it. So when it started here in, in Connecticut, end of February, early March, uh, we really had to take immediate action. And it's really a multifactorial, multi-pronged approach. We posted up an incident command center. First, we had to protect our staff, to your point, because if they're sick, that's not helpful for anyone. So we had to make sure we had adequate personal protective equipment, gloves, gowns, masks, and that was a significant issue. We restricted visitors to reduce the flow in and out of the hospital. And we sent a lot of our employees home to be able, if they could work from home, we sent them home, again, to reduce the risk to them. Of course, we had to increase capacity at the same time. The governor asked us to increase our capacity 50%. So we had to create spaces where there were none before for patients. So to expand both the emergency department capabilities, actually inpatient beds, and then in, most importantly, perhaps in intensive care units. And then we had to make sure we had staff and equipment for those areas. So we had to procure extra ventilators and all the accoutrements that come with ventilators to provide that care. We also stopped doing elective surgery and that had a multi-pronged reason to do that. First, it, it created capacity because our recovery rooms were actually large areas that we could use for intensive care. It also freed up those nursing staff that could then help the critically ill patients. So all our staff can then help the ICU staff. Very importantly, it preserved PPE because again, that was a big challenge in the beginning. And then finally, we, we had five different levels of surge capacity created where uh, we, had, we have a field hospital we put up. We put up uh, beds into big auditoriums to really create uh, extra spaces. And we actually did attain a level three surge. So we have, we opened five different inpatient units for COVID patients, three different intensive care units. So it's really run in a parallel universe because to your point, we still had run a hospital. We still have patients with cancer who had emergency surgery, strokes, heart attacks, and, and trauma. We still had to take care of them. And then finally, of course, so not least, last but not least, we had to serve the public, of course. So we set up a hotline for them to call. We set up a drive-through testing center. So we've tested more than 15,000 people here in, in our region. We set up Fury clinics, fever, upper respiratory infection clinics. So patients didn't have to come into the emergency department if they were sick. They can go to these clinics to be assessed for the severity of their illness and then decide, be triaged, if you will. Um, and uh, so we did all of that kind of in a very short timeline, as you can imagine. And as I said, at the same time, still running, trying to run the enterprise. What's so interesting to me is if you look at how we're responding to this crisis, there is a lot of, of connection to how our military operates when they walk into a crisis situation as well. You talked about force protection, which is essentially ensuring that your service providers, your frontline people are protected. You're talking about a surge of resources. You're talking about uh, innovation and flexibility and adaptability, trying to, you're, you're encountering a landscape and in those hundred days, every day becomes a, a new crisis that needs to be met and solved because the next day you're preparing for and the next week you're preparing for and you're trying to figure it out. Are you all finding that your management styles uh, have needed to adopt and how you, you entrust your people with creating their own adaptations within different departments, are are you finding that you're you're shifting how you operate and how your people operate internally as this crisis, this wave of crises hit hits us? Well, in That's our case, um, in our case, you know, we're all working remotely, and we've been able to uh, keep our uh, grant process running. So, um, we've actually made more grants the beginning of this year than last year. And uh, particularly around, you know, January, February, March is when Medicare patients are really hit hard by out-of-pocket costs. So it's critical for us to keep 
our programs going for patients with cancer and chronic illnesses and rare diseases. Um, so our, our people have been able to do that. And we've added some uh, additional communications. We have a special newsletter we've added aimed at the pandemic and providing information for patients we serve. We've uh, added additional outreach to donors to try to bring in additional funds to support um, our COVID-related uh, assistance program. And we've um, also uh, basically tried to just ramp up um, you know, the uh, overall um, communication. And, and that's one of the biggest worries is that uh, uh, people get out of touch. So um, not only are we doing more newsletters, we're doing more social media, trying to make sure people are getting information that they need, that they're not isolated. And Stephen, you've had to become, in a sense, also a communications company, right? I mean, with all the remote ac access that you have to provide, um, right. your infrastructure must be uh, a bit tested, right? To, to yeah. suddenly shift to a new operating platform. Sure, Mark. So I think in response to your question about management style um, adapting to the situation, I think the, the one great thing about my organization that I found is I'm lucky, really blessed to have a great senior leadership team and board. I think the one thing we did tweak and change is that now on our weekly meetings, we have board members involved talking to the senior directors and even now to staff directly about what their needs are. I think that the, the staff need to know that the leadership of the organization is responding to their needs um, to help them to provide services to the community. So as we've adapted our platforms to provide services to the community, which is telemedicine, social media, our board members have been actively engaged. And I mean, every single one of them have been actively engaged in helping us and talking to our senior management group and talking to the staff about what their needs are. Do they need other services? Are there emotional and mental health support services needed? So I think uh, things change in this sort of a scenario. And I know uh, Dr. Rodas and I had talked a little bit about how this impacts frontline workers. It also affects you know, nonprofits who are providing human services in the community. There's a, a great stress on a lot of our staff for not only dealing with uh, the stress of, of the patients or the clients in the community, but also for themselves, you know, being in social isolation at times, not having the opportunity to work with their teammates. So those are all the great challenges that I'm, I'm proud to say that they've been able to overcome at this point. But we monitor that regularly, Mark. That is a weekly thing we talk about with our staff. So, um, so that's a good question that you brought up. And you're also helping people deal with fear. Right. Correct. We're all living with a lot of fear and nowhere more right. than if you're providing frontline services and nowhere more than if you're in an, in an ER. Uh, John, yeah. you had mentioned yeah. um, some of your concerns about ensuring that you deal with, uh, with the trauma, that people who are delivering trauma-related services themselves is experienced. Yeah, so first let me just respond to the management style. Uh, by happenstance, I'm a high-risk obstetrician, so dealing with kind of un unforeseen emergencies is basically built into my DNA, and uh, I have to thank over, I've right. used pretty much what I've learned over 40 years, uh, both as an obstetrician as well as just being a, a healthcare leader. It's all, it's all come to bear right now, to be honest with you, get through this. I think it, it's, I think Stephen's point's important. The, the challenges for our staff have been incredible. It's an incredibly, I, people can't really appreciate it until you walk through one of these units. 12 hour shifts, wearing all this protective garb. It, it's seeing patients sicker than they've ever seen in their life. So we've lost just, just here at St. Francis, we're 130 people. So there's a lot of death and a lot of dying. And it, with patients that are alone, which is, makes it that much harder. So they're, they've become the surrogate family member besides obviously the caregiver. Um, and I, I think we're gonna be dealing with that actually for a long time. We've done our best to try to uh, keep as positive as we can. We come around with, with little carts uh, that with snacks and they're like kids in a candy shop just to get a little bit of a respite. Um, but it's uh, incredibly challenging. We started playing lullabies overhead when a baby's born just to remind them about that there's actually still good things and happy things that occur in, in the world because you can really lose perspective. In terms of the intersection of different conditions with this situation, we deal um, a lot with, with MS, cystic fibrosis, ALS, there's heart, cancer, and so on. There are a whole range of nonprofits, uh, immunocompromised uh, individuals, including uh, from AIDS and, and other uh, conditions. Um, how do you ensure that the level of care that is required by your normal uh, patients um, is, is provided, John, in, in terms of 
in terms of having to also uh, be concerned about, um, about them coming in perhaps with uh, coronavirus infections. Testing, I understand, is, is ramping up, but still not sort of where everybody would like it to be. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's been an incredible challenge, to be honest with you, because, uh, and we've seen actually more people coming in with more advanced uh, situations because they're not coming in. They're either not coming in because they're afraid to come in and not get coronavirus infection, or they, they really don't have access to their providers. So I think the key there, uh, as was mentioned actually, is ramping up our telehealth capabilities. So really reaching out to those patients of greatest needs and saying, hey, we're still here for you. What can we do? Making sure they're taking their medications and they're doing whatever they need to do. And, and telling them that we have safe areas, COVID safe areas, but then the hospital, we've zoned off really half the emergency department as a COVID free, if you will, COVID safe zone, so that they still can come in if they need to. Uh, but it's a, it's a great point. I think that has been a significant issue. And we have seen more mortalities in the community. People have died at home, unfortunately. Uh, not coming into the hospital. Do you all feel that this will result in a sustained change in your operations and in the in the interactions between the people you serve, uh, your donors, uh, for for example, Dan or uh, Stephen, in terms of your your network of nonprofits? Uh, do you think that this is going to result once the COVID situation starts to subside? And I think we've got a year or more of of real present concern with this disease from, from everyone who, who I've heard, um, will you have to adjust in a systemic way how you operate so that your organization is, is actually transformed? Yeah. That's an a interesting question because before the COVID crisis hit, there was already a lot of concern about um, out-of-pocket cost and Senators Grassley and um, Speaker Pelosi had put forward bills not only to deal with um, the cost of drugs but also to reduce out-of-pocket costs for patients and if there is any kind of silver lining and that might even be way too strong a way to describe it to the uh, uh, pandemic I hope that it will be to um, put additional focus back on the um, issue of affordability um, this uh, pandemic has disproportionately affected uh, seniors and poor uh, people, people without the means to get the best health care. So um, again, the policymakers are distracted now, but we're hoping that they'll get back to the table and lower out-of-pocket costs for patients. Um, you know, at, at, in the near term, our, our focus is on just trying to keep our 60 different assistance programs open because the cancer patients and the MS patients and the Parkinson's patients who we serve still need that help as well as needing additional help to um, uh, pay for food and transportation and other new expenses that have been added on top of their already you know, uh, challenging uh, financial situation. In terms of, of how you forecast um, your, your, uh, the work um, required of your various caregivers and the people who actually run your operations, um, we have a question um, about uh, reports in the media of uh, reduction in hours. Um, are you seeing any of that? Um, uh, John, you seem to be saying that, that quite on the contrary, your people are, are very stressed. Stephen, are you, are you finding um, a reduction in hours as a response to COVID um, in, in your group, or are you or your people also uh, stressed um, in trying to serve uh, your constituents? Yeah, good question. So I think that um, the way we run the organization is that you know we do work quote an eight hour day, but I think my staff are mature and emotionally mature enough to understand and know when they can engage and when they need to disengage, and we've made that clear that um, we allow them that opportunity to be able to disengage when needed and to reach out for help and support from each other. Um, I think that um, the, the problems that we see um, for staff, I think, is the, the whole just understanding the cultural change that's occurred from being able to see people in person, whether it's in the community or in a, um, a hospital or clinical setting, um, to now having to deal with them through telemedicine and uh, through Zoom and other platforms. So it's been a, a cultural change that we've all had to learn and adapt to. 
I do think back to the question you asked before regarding um, long-term change. I see it on two levels. One, and perhaps Dr. Rodas can comment on this, you know, hospital care systems are going to change, I hopefully, dramatically. Some, hopefully, there'll be success stories of how they have worked regionally. I know in the state of New York, my hometown, the governor has asked hospitals to work on a regional basis to be able to work with each other about resources, supplies, hospital beds, equipment. Maybe that is the model we need to look at more now is how do we operate healthcare systems on a regional or statewide basis rather than individual um, organizations. All due respect to boards of directors, you know, we have large constituencies we're trying to serve. So maybe, you know, there's a joint effort by hospitals to, to strategically plan and provide services in a region um, as opposed to the past where they were working in isolation. But for us as an organization, the one thing that we'll adopt is a lot more social media platforms, a lot more telemedicine, a lot more um, opportunities to work with people um, through um, a, a video platform. So that'll be a, a, a change we make that's permanent. Um, that won't be, we won't go back to um, some of the things we did before. We will st still have community engagement, but we will include the video pieces and the technology pieces. Those are critical. And more partnerships with other nonprofits and healthcare facilities, because we realize that no one of us can serve our populations effectively. So, so there, there are a number of points that you've all made. One is telemedicine is here to stay, right? I mean, everybody agrees that it's, that it's here to stay. That's going to result in a fundamental transformation also of the competencies required by organizations like all of yours, because you're all part of that puzzle. You've also talked about the mental health issue. Um, and so the division between physical and mental health uh, might be diminished uh, a bit going forward. And then we also have this idea that Stephen raised about partnerships. You know, we have this situation where it's become dreadfully obvious that when the least of us is not taken care of, in this particular case, the coronavirus being so infectious, it affects everybody. So there's this whole idea about how do we shift our ideas around healthcare from me, me, me to us, us, us. And I think if I, if I can uh, for comment, I, I think it's, you know, first of all, it's also been a tremendous, and I think it's important for all not-for-profits, a tremendous financial impact to all of our organizations. And we've uh, had a decline in revenue of about 50%. I think that's probably true for most hospitals. So I think sometimes the public is a little confused. They may think, oh, we're, it's, a, it's a windfall for us to take care of all these patients. And uh, quite the contrary, by reducing and eliminating a lot of our elected surgeries, of course, that's where hospitals make 50 to 60% of their revenues on procedures and outpatient uh, tests and procedures. So that, uh, that is a, now the question is what's the new normal gonna be like? And I, I do think we're gonna have to reinvent ourselves in some way. I think hospitals are gonna be taking care of a lot just sicker patients. And I think a lot of other patients will seek care in, out, in outpatient settings and ambulatory surgery centers and endoscopy centers, infusion centers, and we'll really come into the hospital for that. Our emergency department volume is down substantially. And I suspect that's gonna last for quite a while because people have sought other ways to seek care, whether it's a teleconsult or an urgent care center outside of the hospital. Uh, so, I, so I think though, so we're gonna have to be more efficient. Uh, and I think we've, we've strived here at St. Francis to be the, the value provider, if you will, the good outcome, low cost provider. I think those providers going forward are gonna be very, very important to continue to bend the cost curve, uh, which is really not sustainable. And that really does, it connects the dots between all of your organizations, right? You've got uh, what you're saying, John, is that this sort of network of, of other types of support, whether it's telemedicine directly through the hospital, uh, partnering with uh, FQHCs um, uh, or, or working with other nonprofits that, that Stephen serves as the glue uh, amongst uh, your work, Dan, in terms of, of uh, finding grants to fill that financial uh, uh, gap. It's basically about taking a more integrative approach that raises the bar on health across civil society, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think that what the pandemic has done is really uh, pressure test the system and expose the fault lines. And the fault lines are, are wide. They're across the reimbursement system. They're across the delivery system. Um, we've all heard a lot in the news recently about social determinants being a big factor in um, outcomes. Unfortunately, um, you know, the COVID crisis has hit uh, communities of color and uh, um, economically disadvantaged communities. So, you know, I think that, again, the, the system 
um, if it is listening, will make changes uh, in, in all aspects, um, whether it's on the delivery side, finding better ways to deal with surge capacity, whether it's you know, on the safety net side, finding ways to strengthen the safety net and ensure that it is there and available and adequately funded, um, or on the policy side, you know, making changes in the way healthcare is paid for so that um, you know, people are not um, uh, able, people who are not able today are able to get the best quality care in a timely fashion. We were seeing Dan's point, I'm I'm just sorry. real quickly, Mark, to Dan's point, I agree with you, Dan. Our relationship with our funders is rapidly changing. We get funding from foundations similar to yours. And we've had to rethink our scope of work, our scope of practice, how we do business now as a result of this pandemic. And I think that will be forever changed. I don't think we'll be going back to the same old way. So it will reshape um, relationships we have with funders and providers in the community. So it's a good point. Thank you, Dan. Extending on that, I, we received a question, which, which John, you might be in the best position to, to, to <laughs> answer. The question is, beyond COVID, do we have to prepare for a world where these kinds of pandemics, these kinds of situations uh, crop up because we're so interconnected, crop up on a regular basis. Do you feel that, that, that that's really how we need to be thinking now? Yeah, I think ever since I read uh, John Barry's book about the 1918 uh, epidemic, to be honest with you, I've always been thinking uh, it's just a matter of time. And frankly, we've lived through already many of them. Uh, 2008, we had a, a massive, uh, flu uh, epidemic throughout this country and the world. Uh, we've had uh, SARS, we've had MERS, which managed to be contained, but they certainly could have easily spread. We've had Ebola. So I, I think, yeah, I think this is, and, and the difference between 1918 and today is that we're so much more of a global world, a global economy, travel is so readily available. So uh, only because the war was going on then is how the disease spread. Uh, they'll be, you know, now it easily spreads, as you've seen this spread. So, yeah, we have to be prepared better than we were this time. Uh, and we again, I look for the of AIDS, public right? policy to help. Excuse me? We can go back to the origin of AIDS, right? I mean, origin of AIDS, which, which theoretically uh, came from animals and was transmitted to humans. Um, I, I think maybe the way we need to look at this is, is on a much broader scope and away from just our own backyard. And once we do that, and we, we look at AIDS, and we look at some of the, 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 the Spanish flu, and this is all part of a continuum, it's just an acceleration, isn't it? Yeah, but I think this, the, the point that Dan made is important, though, too, that we should emphasize, that the comorbidities here, the patients, the patients who are dying aren't just old, have a lot of comorbidities. And of course, the population that's poor tends to have those comorbidities. And we are seeing a racial disparity here in our deaths, particularly African-Americans and Hispanics, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, heart disease, chronic lung disease. I'd like to think a take home message from all of this might be, how about if we spend a little more time and effort on prevention of those chronic conditions, which really ultimately is actually leading to people dying. Uh, the virus is just exposing that in our, in our society. Agreed, and we can Dr. Do this, right? We can do this. We can, we can solve these problems. You all, your people, the heroes on the front line, whether it's raising money for people without or providing the services for people who are in need or providing the direct services for people walking into the hospital with various conditions, you are the people who are solving this problem every day. And we will solve this problem together, won't we? We will. We will. We will. Thank you all so much. It's just been a real pleasure. Dan Klein of the Patient Access Network, the PAN Foundation, Stephen Ramirez, President and CEO of the California Health Collaborative in Fresno, and Dr. John Rodas, President of the St. Francis Hospital and Medical Center in Hartford, Connecticut. Thank you so much. Please thank your staffs. Stay safe and have a just, just a wonderful, wonderful week serving us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you, you, Mark. Take care.